More U.S. sailors and Marines have landed up in West Asia, bringing their number to maybe nobody knows really how much. But what are they actually here for? Over the weekend, we saw a peace summit held in the Saudi city of Jeddah, a very unique peace summit for the Russia-Ukraine war for which Russia was not invited. So what really is happening with that peace? And finally, top contenders, the United States have been knocked out of the FIFA 2023 Women's World Cup. What lies ahead and who are the favourites? We'll be discussing all these stories in this episode of Daily Debrief. So do keep watching and also please don't forget to hit that subscribe button right under this video. Over 3,000 sailors and marines have reported from the United States have reportedly landed up in the Red Sea region in West, West Asia, and it, they are apparently being deployed to counter the Iranian threat. Now, Iran did see some tankers over the past few months, and the United States seems to indicate that that is the reason why so many marines and sailors have been moved so far from U.S. territory into Iran's neighborhood. But what really is happening? What is the logic of this decision? How has Iran responded? To know more about this, we have with us Abdul. Abdul, thank you so much for joining. Us. So, uh, more U.S. troops in West Asia, nothing new, of course, there are a lot of U.S. bases, U.S. deployments, the 5th Fleet is there. But what is the justification that is being given for the latest deployment of around 3,000 Marines and sailors? Well, yesterday, uh, U.S. Central Command issued a formal statement claiming that the latest surge in troops, U.S. already has more than uh, 10,000 troops in and around the region. Uh, because, of course, there is a U.S. Fifth, uh, US Navy fifth fleet is based in Manama, Bahrain, and there are troops in Iraq, in Syria, in other parts of the Gulf region. So it, it claimed that the surge is primarily because of the increasing quote-unquote threats uh, from Iranians, which have attempted to seize, uh, according to the U.S. statement, various civilian ships, and the oil tankers in the region, and, and they claimed that in the last uh, two years, at least 20 ships, either Iranians have seized or attempted to seize. So that is the primary reason. In fact, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Defense Ministry last month also uh, announced uh, deployment of further fighter jets in and around the region, F-16 and so, and so forth. So this is a part of the larger uh, built-up according to the, uh, the official uh, versions, against the alleged Iranian threats in the region. So that's exactly what the U.S. is claiming. But of course, one should not uh, uh, go by these statements issued by the U.S. Central Command. Uh, as I said before, the U.S., of course, ha already has thousands of troops there. And if it wants to provide security to the uh, ships passing across the Persian Gulf region, uh, they have they are cap more than capable enough to do it. I, I, as Iranians are claiming, this is basically a, a provocation uh, uh, in order to, be, uh, as a part of the larger built up against uh, all, uh, of, of course, the changing uh, geo strategy, geo politics, in, as well as uh, what they considered as a larger Iranian uh, influence, rising in Iranian influence. Uh, 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 in the larger uh, West Asian region uh, also. Abdul, so uh, could you also maybe tell, give us a bit of context for what is called this so-called tanker war between the countries? Uh, there have been incidents of seizure. Uh, so what uh, does Iran say, for instance, is the reason for some of these seizures? And have they also responded to this latest troop deployment? Well, as far as the response is concerned, there are multiple uh, ways Iranians have responded to it. Uh, Nasir Kanani, the spokesperson of Iran's foreign ministry, uh, said that uh, uh, U.S. troop deployments in the region has has never provided any security to the countries in the region. It has, it, in fact, it has never been uh, 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 about security, providing security to the countries in the region. It is primarily to serve the strategic interest of the U.S. That is one. Then, then the uh, IRGC uh, commander, spokesperson, also um, uh, talked about uh, the possible uh, uh, mischief which which. Surge, surge, this particular surge uh, could uh, kind of provoke in the region, can can cause in the region and warn against all kind of uh, such uh, attempts. 
saying that Iran is capable enough to respond to all those uh, attempts by the U.S. Then, of course, th there, uh, there is a larger question put uh, forward by the Iranians that why uh, in, in, a, in a region which is um, uh, uh, thousands of miles away from the U.S., the U.S. needs to be there. Uh, if there is a uh, if the reason if the, the, the security of the uh, uh, ships in the region is a concern, the countries in the region can uh, of of course safeguard can do it on their own. Iranians have also proposed a, a regional security alliance, uh, uh, a maritime alliance, including all the countries in the uh, in the in the Persian Gulf region, uh, primarily to provide security uh, to address the security concerns, whatever security concerns may be. And uh, basically to uh, exclude all possible external interventions, uh, 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 U.S. being one. In fact, Iran has been very vocal to all uh, foreign troops' presence in the region and has repeatedly demanded their withdrawal. Uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, the tanker war, war is concerned, well, the tanker war started following the U.S. sanctions uh, 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 on Iran uh, after it Unilaterally withdrew in 2018 and uh, let uh, attempted to seize various tankers, Iranian tankers, all across the globe. One in Mediterranean, then uh, in Atlantic and other places. In retaliation, Iranians also started uh, seizing some of the ships carrying, of course, different flags, but considered to be uh, uh, serving the interest of the U.S. And it this basically happened in 2018, 2019 in particular. It heated up uh, for uh, for some time. It was, of course, not that uh, uh, hot, but it has started. Uh, 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 you can say uh, gaining pace in earlier this year. Uh, but Iranians have claimed that the recent surges in seizure of the ships has nothing to do with the larger uh, U.S. Uh, claims made about Iran being irresponsible and so on and so forth. It is primarily Iranians' attempt to control the smuggle of uh, Iranian oil and also to uh, basically uh, address so the security concerns uh, in the region. Uh, Iran has a long uh, maritime border and uh, some of the ships it claims basically pro uh, had uh, threatened its maritime security. So all those, uh, uh, and of course there are certain claims made which have been uh, refuted by Iranians that those ships it never tried to uh, seize, and this is a part of the U.S. propaganda. So it's a very complex situation, and it seems that U.S. is uh, has used uh, incidents uh, of tanker uh, seizure, some uh, inst instances of tanker seizure, to basically create a hype against uh, uh, alleged Iranian uh, uh, threats. Over the weekend, we saw a peace summit in the Saudi city of Jeddah, where representatives from a number of countries gathered to discuss President Vladimir Zelensky's peace plan. Now, it's a unique peace plan because, one, it does not involve talking to Russia. Second, it puts a lot of conditions on uh, Russia in order to come to peace. Now, what really came out of this summit is a bit confusing. It's not really clear. There was no joint statement, for instance. But we have with us, we go back to Abdul to actually understand the nitty-gritty of it. Abdul, so we discussed this right before the summit, this curious case of a Russia-Ukraine peace summit without uh, war, peace summit without Russia. But what were the major conclusions? The Ukrainians are, uh, you know, spinning it in a very positive light. Well, uh, that, that, that is exactly what it is, uh, spinning. Uh, if you see the reports, whatever reports are available in public, it seems uh, this is only Iran Ukrainians claiming that uh, certain things have been achieved. Apart from the fact that the most of the participants, which also included uh, some of the close allies of Russia, like China, uh, uh, agreed to have another set of meetings uh, in six weeks from now. Uh, apart from that, nothing else is concretely there in the public domain. Ukraine claimed that they have uh, all the participants in the meeting agreed to the 10-point proposal given by Zelensky. The 10 point proposals, as we have discussed before, are nothing more than uh, an attempt to put uh, to uh, portray Russians as the sole villain, sole country responsible for the war in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine, and to hold it responsible without it being invited to any talk. So that was uh, that is the gist of the uh, uh, the talks, uh, as claimed by Ukrainians. But of course, uh, no other country, uh, including China has made any public uh, utterances about what 
happened uh, during the meeting, whether uh, uh, the proposals uh, put forward by Zelensky were uh, discussed or uh, if they discussed whether they were accepted or not. Uh, in fact, Ukrainians also claim that some of the uh, uh, countries considered close, they did not name it, of course, name them, uh, considered close to uh, Russia, tried to uh, create certain problems during the meeting, but ultimately it turned out that all of the participants agreed for the next week. So just to uh, put it in a, a nutshell, it seems uh, from all the re uh, reports available in the public domain that nothing concrete has been achieved so far, apart from the Ukraine, what Ukrainians are claiming. And there will be a next, uh, there will be a meeting uh, uh, in some uh, six weeks from now, uh, again, and where, what will be the integrities, all those details are not there. There is no joint statement issued. There is no, uh, uh, re, uh, uh, no concrete record in public. So we are in no position to verify what the Ukrainians are claiming. Right, Abdul, also, of course, looking at it, this is a larger context. I mean, on the one hand, there is fighting. There have been some talks of negotiation. Uh, both sides have talked about it, but clearly there is no serious will or proposal from uh, both sides. So do we see the situation continuing uh, as, you know, uh, in this pretty much what it has been for the past few months? Well, it seems uh, that this will continue primarily because uh, uh, the negative responses, which uh, all the peace proposals which involve both the countries sitting together and talking, means Ukraine and, and Russia sitting together and talking under some mediation, med mediation have been rejected primarily by the Ukraine or its uh, 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 the countries which are backing Ukraine through armament and other uh, uh, supplies. Uh, and, 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 and until uh, Russia is involved in any negotiation, there cannot be, nobody can, uh, should hope that there will be a, a successful peace uh, 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 agreement. Uh, so all of, even if uh, all the countries which Ukrainians are claiming meet again and say some of the countries withdraw from it in the future, the majority of countries are those countries which have taken pro-Ukrainian stand, which has taken pro-NATO stand uh, in the international uh, uh, forum, wherever uh, uh, the war of Ukraine has been discussed. And uh, since they, are, they have a particular perspective about the uh, conflict, of course, it is possible, very likely, that they uh, basically declare the Zelensky proposal as uh, something to be kind of uh, accepted by all the parties in the war. That would not pressurize if Russians to agree to it. And that, would, that means that the stalemate which is there, at, as far as the uh, political settlement of the conflict is, is concerned, will continue. And uh, until there is a serious attempt made, and all the proposals which have been submitted uh, about bilateral talks between Russia and Ukraine uh, are taken seriously. Of course, there is no uh, uh, end of the conflict uh, in sight. Right. Thank you so much, Abdul, for explaining that as well. And we'll hopefully come back to you for more developments from the region. Finally, continuing our regular coverage of the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 being held in Australia and New Zealand. There have been quite a few developments. The United States has been knocked out, a very formidable contender. A lot of interesting football taking place. We go to Siddhant Andy for the latest. Siddhant, thank you so much for joining us. Our continuing coverage of the FIFA 2023 Women's World Cup. So it looks like the final eight teams have been uh, determined. Big surprise, of course, being the fact that the US women's football team, very renowned team, is out of the tournament. So take us to the last eight. What's interesting? What stands out? What were the surprises? Um, absolutely, Prashant. I mean, spot on. Like, so, so right at the, uh, you know, early on in this tournament, uh, the US has all, always been a favorite when it comes to the Women's World Cup. And, and a couple of coaches actually came out and made this statement that the physical difference that existed between their side and and the other teams in this competition has greatly reduced uh, because you know there's a much larger number of uh, women players now who are getting the same kind of uh, playing time same kind of exposure same kind of uh, coaching uh, as well and 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 so like at least uh, at a physical level many of the teams now uh, at a tempo uh, uh, from a tempo perspective and all of that are really well matched so what we've seen at the round of 16 is almost, uh, I mean, maybe France is an exception, but uh, other than that, very little domination by a single team. It started off 
with Netherlands versus South Africa, and you know, a, a bunch of new teams uh, in this stage of the competition. Uh, so Netherlands, South Africa, even though it ended 2-0 in favour of the Netherlands, South Africa had some really good chances and, and with a bit more perhaps uh, time and uh, at this level, uh, they can uh, probably compete even more. But all the games have been really tight. Sweden versus the US uh, ended in that quite tense penalty shootout. And, uh, you know, Sweden have always had a very strong sort of uh, women's football program. They've done really well at, at various tournaments, whether it's the Olympics or, or at the World Cup. So they will feel like they were never really underdogs in that game. Uh, but given the sheer amount of exposure, the kind of investment in the sport in the US, uh, beating a US team is always going to be a, a great achievement. Uh, so, yeah, so that was, I guess, one of the surprises. Nigeria ran England pretty close as well. Uh, that went down to a penalty uh, shootout uh, as well and, and, and the English uh, women there uh, coming through that. But I think it's a really good mix at this point because you have Colombia represent, uh, representing South America. They also went through uh, earlier tonight after a 1-0 win over Jamaica, who we've heard so much about this tournament and, and seen a lot. Uh, their actually coming here has also been a great story. Uh, you know, Bob, Bob Marley's eldest daughter, uh, for example, helping them find sponsorship, uh, their GoFundMe program uh, to, to, to get support to actually continue the program, to get exposure. Uh, and now I think uh, the federation back in Jamaica will have plenty to think about when this team gets back. Because, I mean, uh, definitely, uh, if it is a comparison with the men's team, then, uh, you know, there's so much more potential here for the team to go deeper in the tournament and uh, play on. And, and we also saw, for those who talk about, like, the women's game in the context of it being uh, far less physical and, you know, it's a contact sport, but they play with a little more uh, sort of care and all of that. Today's game, uh, Jamaica versus Colombia, was uh, full on. I, I mean, as uh, full contact as you, as you can imagine, and, and played with the, the the kind of you know fire that you would expect uh, from a round of sixteen knockout tournament at this level. And both teams looking to uh, sort of keep their regions, uh, not just their countries, in in the World Cup. So so uh, it's been a really good round of sixteen, Prashant, and we're hoping for more of the same when it comes to the quarters. Absolutely, Siddhant. You mentioned, of course, Colombia. Uh, of course, a lot of us associate football so closely with Latin America. So, must be a happy moment for Latin American fans in Australia and many other parts of the world. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. I, in fact, I was talking to uh, an artist. She's a, she's a vocalist and, and, and uh, I think the local organizing committee is talking to her to uh, do the national anthem of Colombia if they make it through to you know, the last stage of the tournament. Uh, and she was talking about how the entire Latin American community, uh, Sydney is where they've played a bunch of their games. Uh, so th th there's a large-ish community and, and people are wondering how there are 60,000 Colombians in Sydney. But it turns out that actually the entire uh, Latin uh, community or uh, whether you're from Argentina or Peru or Chile, uh, everyone has picked up a Colombia jersey and now is sort of backing the team from the region. So I was asking her, you know, how this fits in with uh, what we've covered often or we, what we continue to cover on People's Dispatch uh, with this kind of resurgence of, of Latin American uh, collectivism and, and, and that approach. And she was saying, yeah, it's very, very evident in the community here. You know, uh, they are looking at what's happening back home uh, and also banding together. They've organized in various different ways to, uh, to have these kind of social events to, to expose people because they are also... They are diaspora, so they are Australian as well as belonging to whatever nationality they belong to. So expo exposing both sides to each other's cultures. And and and, uh, and what she was uh, telling me was that because of this World Cup also coming in here, uh, the kind of interest level in the sport in general has uh, gotten such a boost uh, that groups who were not perhaps before involved have uh, gotten in it uh, much more. And 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 so for... for uh, you know, this entire lot of people here, I mean, they are in that World Cup mode. Uh, so it's like when, when you have a World Cup in Brazil, uh, on days when there are matches happening in the national team are playing, it's a national holiday, it's a given. So it's almost like that kind of a, a, a vibe here, uh, which is great to see. Um, and uh, like, otherwise, it's a small town, but we're hoping like tonight after the win over Jamaica, um, Sydney might be a little bit uh, alive later into the evening uh, in a more sort of Asian way. 
so so in that sense uh, the, the those kind of uh, i don't know whether it's spirit or or what you you want to call it but but it's also taking over a country where rugby and other sports are uh, actually uh, a little bit further ahead than than football is hey thanks sudant as usual bringing in a bit of politics into sports in fact we really don't buy that distinction here at people's dispatch so thank you so much for speaking to us and hopefully we'll get back when the semi final lineup is ready and that's all we have time for in today's episode we'll be back tomorrow with many more ep- stories from countries across the world so do keep watching and reading people's dispatch and do hit that subscribe button on the youtube channel